Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing the war in Yemen with Isaac Evans France, the executive director of Action Corps, a grassroots humanitarian advocacy organization that co-leads a nationwide coalition to end U.S. complicity in the Saudi war on Yemen. Action Corps provided support to activists in over 12 U.S. cities who organized Yemen war protests the first week of March. You can see actioncorps.org, and Corps is spelled C-O-R-P-S. Isaac Evans-France, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks for having me. So thanks for coming on. How did these actions go in the first days of March? They were powerful. We had people in front of congressional offices across the United States from coast to coast. People were gathering together and calling on their members of Congress to reintroduce a Yemen war powers resolution to call on Saudi Arabia to completely lift its blockade on the people of Yemen and calling for the removal from office of Brett McGurk, the National Security Council's Middle East North Africa advisor. There was so much energy, people coming together and gearing up for continued mobilization to once and for all stop U.S. complicity in the war on Yemen and to make sure that the United States takes responsibility for the damage that this country has already caused. And how was the uh, attention provided by the corporate media and independent media and other communication systems to all of this activism? You know, there was interest, and I think part of the interest was around the one-year anniversary of the war on Ukraine, where people were seeing similarities in the fact that there are humanitarian crises in two different parts of the world, but that have received such disparate media attention. Yeah, what uh, I mean, if if people of Yemen got the media attention and uh, and the financing uh, from the U.S. government that Ukraine gets, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't have so much of a problem. I'm I'm willing to bet. It's true. And in in now eight years of the Saudi led bombing and blockade of Yemen with U.S. support, there, Yemen has received less humanitarian aid than in just far less humanitarian aid than just in a year of the war on Ukraine. So it, it's and this isn't about humanitarian crisis Olympics. It's about making sure that we're standing with our siblings around the world, no matter what the color of their skin, no matter what the religion that they practice and no, no matter what alliances the United States might have. And, and when you say humanitarian aid to Ukraine, you're distinguishing that for you. You're not counting the, the tanks and the and the guns and the bullets, I'm assuming. No, I'm not even talking about that. Just in terms of humanitarian aid. Yeah. You know, in, in my in my opinion, and I think I share this with my colleagues at Action Corps, you know, a human life is has value and regardless of where that person lives. I, I had a guest on this program talking about the war in Yemen several months back now, uh, who looked at the UN estimate of deaths in Yemen at a, a, almost 400,000 and said, most people aren't counted. Most people aren't even uh, taken note of. They, they die in their homes. There's no record kept. It's got to be over a million. Uh, how do you estimate the, the human damage in Yemen and how do you compare it with estimates thus far in Ukraine? I don't have that data. Um, you know, I, I'm, I have the same limitations as the United Nations and others who are doing this work, but I would, I would say that uh, the Yemen data project, one piece of data that I can speak to is the airstrikes on Yemen and the airstrikes on water treatment facility plants, on hospitals, let alone the farms, funeral homes, weddings over the years. We've been really glad to see that in the last 11 months, there hasn't been a single Saudi airstrike on Yemen as a result of the ceasefire truce that began April 1st. But that's that truce has expired. There's nothing in writing that's going to keep Saudi Arabia from resuming the airstrikes. And that's why one of the reasons why we're calling for another Yemen war powers resolution to make sure that 
no airstrikes could resume with U.S. complicity. And you're planning for a new round of activism March 25th, is that right? That's true. March Saturday, March 25th is the eight-year anniversary of the Saudi-led bombing of Yemen. And at 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time in the United States, we will join Peace Action and a number of other organizations like the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, the Friends Committee on National Legislation, among others, to have an online rally to hear from a number of people, including members of Congress, like Representative Rashida Tlaib. And we have invited folks like Dr. Shireen Aladimi. She has confirmed that she will provide some words as well uh, on that day. And we're working with folks in the United Kingdom as well who will be participating because this is not just the United States that has been providing military support, but also the United Kingdom and other countries as well. We will put a link on talkworldradio.org to actioncore.org, actioncore with C-O-R-P-S dot org. And I will ask World Beyond War and Roots Action and other organizations to promote it as much as they can. Um, what uh, what exactly is the state of affairs in Yemen? Because I hear mixed messages. Some people think things are going pretty darn well. There's a truce. There's the possibility of a negotiated uh, sustainable peace agreement that will end this uh, forever. No need for Congress to do anything. Um, what's uh, what's happening? Well, I, I disagree 100% that there's no need for Congress to do anything. And this is a critical moment where we need Congress to weigh in, when we need Congress to stand up and to pass a Yemen war powers resolution to put that pressure. Just the just introduction of the Yemen war powers resolution would be an important step. And any member of the House or Senate could do that. So this is, in terms of the situation on the ground in Yemen, and I will say I've never been to Yemen. I work with a lot of Yemeni American activists and advocates who know far more about this than I, but what I have learned is that first of all, there is not an act of truce. The ceasefire truce expired in October. It was a fragile truce. We got through October, but there hasn't been a renewal of a truce. There are talks that are happening among the different parties in Yemen. It appears that Saudi Arabia has been looking for a way to get out of this. It's been a very costly war. At one point, Saudi Arabia was spending billion dollars a week to fight this war uh, they you know it's expensive to come <laughs> it's expensive in terms of dollars but it's also expensive in terms of Saudi Arabia's relationship I mean in a, its a reputation and it's real and we want to make sure that that cost is even higher in terms of its ability to act militarily if it were to continue those airstrikes so that's a a little bit on the ground, you know, one of the issues is that there continues to be what expert, humanitarian experts describe as a de facto blockade of Yemen. So that the Saudi Arabia has ena enabled this blockade, which has severely limited the amount of fuel that's enabled to enter the country, limited medicines that can get in. Just a few days ago, for the first time in years, was a con a, a ship with containers able to get in and the containers contain can contain medical equipment, medicines and other needed supplies. So there's there continues to be the the causes and of the ongoing humanitarian crisis. People have not been getting paid their salaries either. That's been a real challenge when people are working for the government for eight years, but they can't get paid. You, you mentioned, uh, Isaac Evans France, you mentioned the War Powers Resolution and that under this law, a single House or Senate member can force a debate and a vote on ending U.S. participation in a war. And we know that Senator Bernie Sanders was going to do this on Yemen and backed off. Uh, we know that both houses did it and voted successfully uh, when they were assured of a veto by President Trump, who did, in fact, veto. Um, we know also that uh, Congressman Gates has now done this on 
on Syria. Uh, so there's going to be, I assume, a debate and a vote on ending U.S. participation in war making in Syria. I don't know how that impacts uh, demanding the same thing at the same time on Yemen. Um, and I've, hear, I've heard arguments that I can't make any sense of uh, that it would be hurtful, not helpful for the U.S. Uh, to use the War Powers Resolution on Yemen. Um, what's, uh, what's your take on all of this? So first of all, the, the concern that I have heard is that by stopping U.S. complicity and support for Saudi Arabia in this war, that that could strengthen the Houthis' control in Yemen. The Houthis control about 80% of the population of Yemen, about half of the territory of the country. They started as this rebel group that staged this coup over eight years ago. That was what Saudi Arabia was responding to in the bombing campaign that they began in, in Operation Decisive Storm, uh, which hasn't been decisive at all. It's, it was supposed to take just a few days, and it's turned into now eight years. So... Um, Back to the question of the opposition to the Yemen War Powers Resolution, you know, I, th I think that there are a number of political challenges and oftentimes we see excuses on the policy front when the real problem is political. So when Trump was in office, Democrats were standing up to the leader of the other party. Now that Democrats control both the Senate and the White House, when standing up to the president is a little less fashionable for most Democrats. That's one thing. Second, second of all, for the Republicans, they risk uh, being accused of being soft on Iran because the Houthis have an alliance with Iran. There are concerns about uh, Houthis' ability to, to, to uh, really oppose the Gulf states, oppose America, oppose Israel, there, those are some of the concerns, and those. Uh, so, so, so I think that politically it, it can be a little bit difficult. But this is the thing: is that we had saw last December, it was Bernie Sanders, it was Chris Murphy, the senator Democrat from um, from Connecticut, who were making floor speeches in support of the Yemen War Powers Resolution. We also, it was publicly known that Senators Mike Lee, the constitutional conservative from Utah, as well as Senator Rand Paul, a libertarian from Kentucky, that they were supportive of the Yemen War Powers Resolution as well. So this is, it had a re Republican support, Democratic support, and independent support. This is something that can successfully be introduced and it can be used as a mobilizing tool to really put the pressure on Saudi Arabia to stop its blockade, to make sure that humanitarian and commercial goods get into the country, and to also keep this on the radar of, of Congress and of the American public. Sounds good to me. Um, didn't, didn't this crisis develop more than eight years ago and didn't a quote unquote successful drone war by the United States uh, have a contributing role uh, in creating this mess in the first place? Yes, this, this war definitely started prior to eight years ago in terms of the civil conflict within Yemen. Um, I have really focused on the, and Action Corps has focused on the humanitarian crisis that's resulted from the bombing and blockade campaign that Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and their coalition, including support from the U.S., started waging on March 25th of 2015. That's when the, the United States really became, began you know, it was re providing diplomatic cover. It was providing the mid-air refueling of the Saudi fighter jets that were then dropping bombs on civilians. That's uh, that has caused a huge, huge humanitarian crisis. Um, in terms of the political dynamics before uh, March of 2015, it's something that I am not an expert on. Uh, but I I will say that the the war on th there was a war in Yemen prior towards prior to March 2015. But the war on Yemen started eight years ago. And that war wasn't announced from Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, but that war was announced from Washington, DC. That's how linked the United States has been to this conflict for now three administrations. But Let's make sure this doesn't go into a fourth administration. 
Couldn't agree more. I just, I'm old enough to remember there were robot airplanes shooting missiles into people all around Yemen. And there was uh, even a young man named uh, Islami, I believe his name was, who testified in the US Congress. Mm -hmm. that his particular village was hit that day before. He testified before Congress and he said, nothing could have empowered these rebels in Yemen like these US drone strikes. These are counterproductive in the extreme. Uh, and I would talk to the general public and they would say, oh, well, a drone war is better than any other kind of war. And I would say, but there wasn't any other kind of war and there's going to be uh, because of these drone strikes. Um, and I, I feel like that history has just gotten erased and we've said Saudi Arabia started a war and the United States has played mm -hmm. the evil role of assisting them. Mm -hmm. But the United States, it seems to me, helped get the thing started. I don't know. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe I'm wrong. I mean, one of the things that I understand about this is that when the when Saudi Arabia was preparing for this uh, these airstrikes on the Houthis in Yemen in March of 2015, the United States had just before that, under President Obama's leadership, had signed the Iran deal to limit the nuclear capacity of Iran um, to have a, a path forward to peace. Now, Saudi Arabia didn't like that, that the United States was signing this agreement with their adversary. And so, in a way, the United States participation in the war on Yemen was a consolation prize. My hope is that by removing itself from the conflict in Yemen by uh, ceasing to harm and enable the harming of Yemeni civilians, that the United States could uh, move forward in the effort to develop peace with Iran as well. That would certainly be wonderful. Uh, Isaac, you mentioned on your list of demands removing one particular official from the State Department. Uh, can you elaborate a little on why and what, what good that would do? Sure. So Brett McGurk is the Middle East and North Africa advisor for the National Security Council. He has been an architect of U.S. participation in the war in Yemen. He has backed the invasion of Iraq. He's backed the, in, the militarism, the sort of uh, rock hard alliances with Middle East dictatorships at the cost of human rights, at the cost of civilian life, at the cost of the United States reputation, and even at the cost of the President Biden's campaign promise to end US participation in the war in Yemen as well as once he was uh, once he was elected and began serving his his pledge two years ago to end uh, U.S. Part participation in offensive airstrikes in, in Yemen, in offensive operations. You know, this is something that Brett McGurk, the senior advisor for Middle East and North Africa, or the the coordinator, I should say, for the National Security Council. He bears so much responsibility for the U.S. Middle East policy. And it's kind of interesting that a holdover from the Trump administration would be able to continue serving in the Biden administration. And there are you know, many Americans who are calling for his removal and over 70 organizations around the United States are backing this call for him to be move, removed from office, saying that this should this does not represent uh, a, a path to peace does not represent a path towards any sort of consistency or integrity in U.S. foreign policy, and that his uh, continued presence in that role is actually a detriment to the path that we need to be pursuing as a country. You mentioned campaign promises by Joe Biden, and we can go back also, I think, and look at the Democratic Party platform of two and a half years ago. Uh, and weren't they supposed to stop shipping weapons to Saudi Arabia? In fact, treat Saudi Arabia as a pariah state uh, and stop participating in this war, effectively ending this war. I mean, I can understand Congress members uh, actively forgetting all of that uh, because they've become court jesters to the, to the president's court. But Ordinary people, why do ordinary people have to forget those promises because to show that we're smart enough to know that politicians lie? I mean, why can't we be smart enough to remember what they said and try to hold them to it? This is, I don't understand. Yes. 
we don't have to forget the promises that politicians have made. And that's exactly why we supported activists around the country in organizing just in the beginning of March to hold their members of Congress accountable, to call on them to introduce the Yemen War Powers Resolution, to call for congressional hearings, to call for for an increase in humanitarian aid, not a decrease like the United States is doing right now. This is a time for us to be standing up and taking responsibility for the harm that's been caused, not a time to be shirking from that responsibility. Yeah, Yemen needs what about four billion dollars and is getting one something billion dollars whereas there's a, a 113 billion dollars largely in weapons going to ukraine do i have those numbers right yeah it was over four billion dollars that the united nations announced just a few few days ago that they are looking for for yemen that's over four billion dollars in humanitarian in need and the United States has pledged a paltry amount, especially given the responsibility of the United States for causing the humanitarian crisis in the first place. So we, Action Corps, and dozens and dozens of other countries around this country are calling for the United States to increase its humanitarian assistance because of its responsibility and because of its duty to make good on the and, and provide reparations for the harm that this country has caused. And and this is not $4 billion for the cause of a glorious, defensible, necessary war. This is $4 billion to keep little children from starving to death, right? What, That's correct. Just statistic, every 75 seconds, a kid starves to death in Yemen. Is that is that accurate? Where does that come from? That was based on a prediction from the head of the World Food Program who said that if we don't change course, a child is going to starve to death every 75 seconds. And that is something that we have really tried to make sure that people understand in terms of the severity of this crisis. It's really good that the airstrikes have stopped, but that hasn't, that hasn't resulted in real meaningful change for most people in Yemen. Most people in Yemen are are continuing to be in need of humanitarian assistance. In fact, two thirds of the population depends on humanitarian assistance. So cutting the budget like the United States is doing for Yemen for humanitarian assistance and having plans to cut it again next year, you know, that's basically a death sentence for so many Yemeni families. And we, you know, people shouldn't have to, to be choosing between which of their children gets to survive. People shouldn't be having to choose which family member is going to be is going to have to starve. That's just not the sort of choice that we believe any human being should be having to face, especially not as a result of the complicity of this of this country and the, the active military participation of the United States in the war on Yemen. You know, I was so thrilled when the Congress used the War Powers Resolution on Yemen for the first time ever used it since 1973 when it was created, uh, that is successfully passed measures under it. Uh, but of course, they knew Trump would veto and Trump vetoed, and then they got a Democrat in the White House and they dropped the whole thing. I, I, I want it for two reasons. One, because it might help stop the starvation of some of these people, including little children in, in Yemen. And second, because of the president, because I do want to turn around the next day and say, okay, now end this one and this one and this one too. Um, isn't, there, isn't there something dramatically important to be accomplished in just getting the Congress to use the War Powers Resolution? Absolutely. Yes, Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution says that Congress has the power to over war. Not, it's not the president. And the United States Congress has to stand up because if the U.S. Congress doesn't stand up, then nobody is. And we need to, ha to, to establish that separation of powers, that, that clear, um, that power of Congress. Congress has been abdicating its responsibility over war, and this is a really important method that it can use to, to reassert its power uh, per the Constitution and the 1973 War Powers Resolution. You know, one of the things that's beautiful about the War Powers Resolution is it's about, it's just, it's just Congress doing its job. It's not about anything particularly new. It's just saying, hey, the president doesn't have permission to have the United States be participating in this war. 
and that needs to stop. You actually need to come get permission from Congress before you continue with this engagement in hostilities. And I also love the fact that this is something that has political support across the political spectrum, as evidenced by the diversity of political uh, ideologues in Congress. You know, we see that the, the the you know the Libertarian Institute was calling for these this day of protest on March first, twenty twenty three. The Code Pink was calling for this. You, know, you have people across the and organizations across the political spectrum, and it was interesting to see in December that there were or very conservative uh, organizations, not just libertarians, but organizations that are funded by the Koch brothers that are typically supporting Republican talking points that were reaching out to members of Congress and to their supporters across the US in support of the Yemen war powers resolution. There is actually, there is left right energy in this country for reining in military spending and making sure that the United States is not getting involved in these uh, conflicts that last for years and years and put at risk American lives as well as lives of people around the world. It'd, it'd be nice if having elected a president who campaigned on this and then having reelected all those Congress members who voted for it before, if that were enough, uh, given that this is all done in the name of democracy. Um, but what's what's the ideal outcome beyond that uh, for Yemen? Is, is there a truth and reconciliation process needed? C criminal prosecution process needed? What what establishes a peace that that lasts in Yemen? It's so important for people in Yemen, civil society organizations, particularly women led organizations, women's organizations, youth organizations to be at the table in talking about what's next. I can talk about U.S. policy. I think it's really important that a diversity of Yemeni voices are at the table in talking about Yemeni policy moving forward. The United States does, I believe, have a moral obligation to provide reparations for the harm that this country has caused in Yemen. The United States should start with stopping that harm by passing the Yemen War Powers Resolution to end unconstitutional U.S. involvement in the conflict, it also should make sure that the blockade that Saudi Arabia has been enabling and, and defending it be completely lifted, the air and naval blockade. And we should have a hearing in the United States. To date, I have not heard of any congressional hearing about the U.S. responsibility and particularly individuals in this administration and the last and the, and the previous who are responsible for the, the, the war crimes that have been committed in Yemen. We can, st there, there's, there's many actors in this conflict that have caused measurable destruction. We can start with addressing our own. Very, very good idea. Many very good ideas. Uh, we've been speaking with Isaac Evans, France, and the organization is Action Corps. You can go to actioncorps, dot org on the internet to follow up. Uh, Isaac, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.